Hello, BookTube. A fascinating little discussion has begun to snowball here in our little corner of BookTube, and I wanted to weigh in on it, since it's a quintessentially dude-bro type discussion, at least to the point where it's progressed so far, and I am the acknowledged king of dude bros. <laughs> and it's, it's a subject that started on uh, Brian's channel, Bookish, about hard books and whether or not you should read them, and you, that you don't have to read hard books. No one's saying that, no one's making you do these things. It's, there is no gated community here. Uh, and a number of booktubers took that up, took that subject up, and bounced it around themselves in a string of really entertaining videos. I'm going to leave them all linked down below so that you can go and see what you think about it. Uh, and I wanted to weigh in on it for a couple of different reasons, on a couple of different headings. Uh, because on the one hand, I agree completely with rejecting the have-to-read part. There, there is no prescriptive element here at all. When you are an adult out in the world reading for fun, reading for pleasure, all of your reading should be entertainment. That should be the goal of all of it. Now, keep in mind, there are different kinds of entertainment, right? There's different kinds of pleasure that you can get from reading. Some of it is short-term. I would argue that most people who read for pleasure read for short-term pleasure. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Some of the pleasure is long-term where you want to master a certain subject or a certain author, and you know perfectly well, especially those of you who've done it, that doing that will require lots of reading that isn't, in the moment, pleasurable. It's the end goal that's pleasurable. It's the end goal that's enjoyable. But not 10 bad books by a certain author. You want to read them all because you know that the pleasure you defer is going to mean a larger pleasure down the line when you can feel like you know that author's work. Okay, there are many different kinds of pleasure. Fortunately, we're not children here, so that doesn't require much belaboring. But the, the underlying point sometimes does require belaboring, which is that pleasure should still be the ultimate be-all and end-all of this. Another point that I want to make is that uh, there is a conditionality here. There is a, pres a prescriptive element in some cases of reading, which is why my own response to this subject would be you don't have to read hard books unless. <laughs> and there might be legitimately something on the other end of that unless. For instance, you don't have to read hard books or books that you don't want to read or long books or whatever the off-putting description is. You don't have to read hard books unless you want to participate in this college class or this university lecture. In that case, those reading those books is required. I want to point out that that this and most of the cases that I'm going to bring up do not apply in the United States of America, but everywhere else in the world and in the United States before 2015, going all the way back to its founding. Not now, but and I'm aware of that. I just want to make sure you know that I'm aware of that. But elsewhere in the world, a college professor can say to you, well, you don't have to read these books, but you must read them if you want to participate in this class. Same thing with any kind of technical qualification. You need to read these manuals. You need to read these textbooks if you want to be qualified as a doctor or an air traffic controller or an electrician or something like that. Again, except in the United States, but everywhere else in the world, that kind of reading would be required. It's, that would be a perfect case if you don't have to read these hard books unless you want that certificate. And if you want that, well, then you do have to read these. Uh, and that also applies to little, to little more wishy-washy hum humanistic things. Uh, because I know that in the 21st century, we live in the age of making your own reality. Thanks to social media, thanks to our phones. Most people think you scroll on your phone, but I, that's not true. For a huge number of people who have their phone, they live inside their phone. They don't actually live in the real world. They've created a world inside their phone, and that's where they live. Where... Uh, I don't even know. Uh, uh, vaccines are harmful. The earth is flat. Trump won the 2020 election. Uh, Trump won the 2020 election, as he himself maintains, in a 50-state landslide. You, you can choose, you can say, in the world that I want, in the reality that I want, those are the things that are going to be true. I'm world-building, in, like in a science fiction novel, but I'm actually going to live in that world. 
I'm going to prune out all the people who disagree with me on any of the subjects that I choose to believe, and I'm going to put all the believers, the fellow believers, on my phone and just live there. I know that that is the case in the 21st century, but nevertheless, it's a stupid fantasy <laughs> that is encouraged by social media companies and also grifters and also a waiting in the wings autocracy that knows that if it lulls you into a sheepish sense of security just long enough, it will be able to have agents at your door. Uh, I, know, I know we live in, in an era of building your own reality, but that is, it is nevertheless not true. So even when it comes to more humanistic things, uh, you're going to see, we're gonna, I'm going to go through the list of all the people that were involved here. You'll see that even in these, this purely secular, purely free time type reading that we're talking about, purely enjoyment driven reading that we're talking about, there is still an unless. It's your own choice. No one's looking down on you. All of this is up to you. And as you can tell from the infinite variety of this little area of BookTube, it's going to be joyously celebrated. It's only idiots and snobs that will look down on you for making any kind of reading choice. Uh, but nevertheless, that reading choice will abut against the hard outlines of some realities that are not negotiable. Reality is actually not negotiable. The Earth is not flat. <laughs> Vaccines are not harmful. Trump did not win. It's as simple as that. These, there is such, still such a thing as factual reality, even in the world of literature. So let's go through, first we'll go through... Uh, the bookish list of the books that he nominates. One would be Ulysses by James Joyce. Uh, then Infinite Jest by David Foster Wallace. Cloud Atlas by David Mitchell. 2666 by Roberto Bolaño. The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. Foucault's Pendulum by Roberto Eco. Gravity's Rainbow by Thomas Pynchon. Paradise by Toni Morrison. And In Search of Lost Time by Proust. You can see right away from that list where I'm going with that whole parenthetical unless, right? Because you don't have to read any of these things. Absolutely not. Unless you're in school outside of America and you are assigned to read them. Then you do. Uh, it, it, in normal life, in the normal reading life that we, that we chronicle here on BookTube, you don't have to read any of those things. But if you want to say, if you want to be let's say, knowledgeably conversant in French literature. Well, then you have to read In Search of Lost Time. If you want to say, if you want to be knowledgeably conversant in modern 20th century Irish literature, then for good or ill, and a spoiler, it's all ill, you have to read Ulysses by James Joyce. Uh, if you want to be, if you want to say that you are conversant, that you are knowledgeable on the literature of the American South, you have to read The Sound and the Fury by William Faulkner. I don't think you'll like it, but you have to read it. That's where the, the unless comes in. That is where the prescription business comes in. It's only a question of your own desire, of your own desire. You cannot, if you say in the 21st century, guided by grifters and your cell phone, if you decide, well, I'm going to say that I'm extremely knowledgeable about French literature, but I don't want to read In Search of Lost Time, and I'm not going to do it. And if you try to make me do it, my parents will sue you. And I'll call you a racist and get you fired from your job. Uh, okay, fine, you can do all that. But if you don't read that, if that, if that omission is present, then your claim is wrong. <laughs> it's as simple as that. You can say it all you want. You can, you can repeat it endlessly on Twitter. You can just put it in all caps and write over and over again. Indigenous science is science. Indigenous science is science. Indigenous science is science. Over and over and over again. Doesn't make it true. It's not true. Uh, I'm sad as a parenthetical here that a lot of these books don't have any unless to them. If you want to be knowledgeable in uh, post-war American fiction, I would say certainly you have to read Gravity's Rainbow, maybe even as much as I hate to say it. I think the guy's a footnote. I honestly think he's going to disappear once his cult dies out. You might have to read Infinite Jest. I don't think so, but you might have to. You definitely don't need to read any Cormac McCarthy. He's gone. He's out the window. He's not going to be there. In 30 years, people are only going to vaguely remember him. And I can tell you the names of the Cormac McCarthy's of 30 years ago. So I was there. I watched it happen. I don't have any doubt. His cult of personality cannot keep his re his reputation alive. The minute their younger brothers or their nephews get a hold of his books and realize how dumb they are, that will just evaporate. But I have to say here, I'm always touched uh, 
by Brian's Love of Paradise by Toni Morrison. I uh, Ordinarily, you would think, well, Toni Morrison might be on this. She will certainly survive. She will certainly be canonical and canonized. But you would think it would be for The Color Purple or The Song of Solomon. Uh, I'm always a little touched by Brian's affection for Paradise, especially since, as a critic, I could, it's a rare occasion where I completely agree. It has all of the linguistic beauty that can be found in long stretches, or I would argue sometimes in flashes, in The Song of Solomon. But it's a wiser book. It's a it's a it's almost prayerfully wise. It's I think by far the most beautiful thing that she ever wrote. So it's always wonderful to see it on a list like this. But Brian's list was not alone. It was taken up. David Novak reads poetry. Did a list. Did a wonderful chatty video. I'll leave links to all of these people down below for you to go to subscribe to them. He did a wonderful, really. Uh, thoughtful video about what kinds of things these are. He mentions Infinite Jest, he mentions Ulysses, he mentions the Bible, and other holy books, the Tao Te Ching, the Bhagavad Gita, the I Ching. He mentions all of them as hard books, and some of them are hard, God, God knows. I have been trying repeatedly to understand the I Ching without success forever. <laughs> forever. And the Tao Te Ching, too. Uh, I've written about them extensively over in many venues over many years, always trying with every new edition to try to understand them, and it never works. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they're perfect examples. Actually, big canonical religious texts like that are perfect examples of books that are usually considered things that you have to read, even though you don't. Uh, it, was, it was a fascinating response. And of course, when you've got a big bookish bro-tube subject waving around in the air like this, you're going to draw gricks like a shark to chum in the water. <laughs> so, of course, he weighed in with his own list of books uh, that he's going to read whether you want to or not. He wants to tackle these huge books. His list was Life and Fate by Vasily Grossman, which is brilliant. Uh, he also mentions The Essays of Montaigne, also brilliant. The Anatomy of Melancholy by Robert Burton, which is not brilliant. Do bros love it because it, it is just such a gnarly urtext of the, the, the smarter end of the dude bro spectrum. They just, the, the, the I mean, this, the dude bro spectrum, the dude, dude bros, like everything happens on a spectrum. There are really deep dude bros who would deny that they are such things, but they still don't believe that women really exist. Or if they do believe that, they certainly don't believe they're human. Uh, and then there's a, all, all the way to the other end of the list where they're, they're getting the short form summary of the four hour work week. <laughs> Uh, the, the ones on the, on the so-called deep end of the dude bro spectrum, they're still as cloistered as married old nuns. They still read almost nothing. But they love Anatomy of Melancholy because it's big and brickish and really in-depth and allows them to just parade their pedantry. Just uh, It's amazing the way it does. But it is, nevertheless, a fascinating book. Uh, Grix also mentions Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann and all of Shakespeare and the Bible and the uh, History of the World by J.M. Roberts, which... It's a bit dry at times, but still very interesting choice. And The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire by Edward Gibbon. These are all, you know, the seven summits. These are all great peaks to be to be mastered, to be to be mounted. And they all have their worth. And they are a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Maybe not so much things like Anatomy of Melancholy, uh, but not only in the narrow sense of 20th century Russian literature, for instance. If you want to be conversant, if you want to say that you know 20th century Russian literature, you have to read Life and Fate. Simple as that. You might not like that, but you can't insist on Twitter your way out of it. You can't simply encounter Life and Fate, think, I don't feel like doing that. I'd rather just scroll on my phone. And then when the time comes, just re mindlessly, angrily repeat, indigenous science is science. Indigenous science is science. Indigenous science is science. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. You cannot bully reality. If you want to be conversant in, 20 in 20th century Russian literature, you have to read Life and Fate. If you want to be conversant in the history of histories of Rome, or even the history of histories, you have to read Gibbon. Maybe not the whole thing, but you have to be conversant in at least something about Gibbon. And the broader focus here, uh, the, maybe the elephant in the room here, is that in addition to being con saying or being conversant in whatever sliver subject we're talking about, Russian literature, Russian history, English history, no matter what sliver subject you're talking about, there's also a broader thing, which is to say that you are well-read. 
you absolutely do not have to read The Anatomy of Melancholy to be well-read. But you have to read the Bible and Shakespeare to be well-read. You don't have to be well-read. <laughs> you don't have to be well-read. You can just go through your life enjoying what you read. No one, except worthless snobs, will criticize you for that. No one worthwhile, no one worth listening to, you criticize you for just ignoring that stuff and reading whatever the hell you want. You should read whatever the hell you want. You only get one life to read, and you have enough things in your life that aren't enjoyable. You should only do that. All I'm asking when you do that, I want you to do that. I want you to tell me all about it. I will not only love to hear about it, but I'll be the first attack dog out of the gate to attack anyone who attacks you for reading that sort of stuff. I'll be the first one to slap them down. All I ask in return is that if you are completely without the Bible, have never encountered it at all, completely without Shakespeare, completely without Jane Austen, for instance, all I ask is that you don't call yourself well-read, or at least don't do it in my hearing. You are not. You don't get to determine what constitutes that. What constitutes that is determined without you. It, it doesn't matter how much you repeat, indigenous science is science, indigenous science is science. That isn't true. I'm not saying it's important. It's not. You don't have to be well-read. Just don't say you are if you're not. Uh, anyway, uh, we get the same thing. The same thing comes up in the next channel. That reading guy uh, does a, a list, and there are overlaps. His list is the tale of Genji, and again, <laughs> again, you can say, "I love Haruki Murakami. I read everything he does. I'm not always all that happy with it, but I read everything that he does. I think he's a genuinely important author. I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with you, even that far. I wouldn't disagree with you." And I wouldn't necessarily start lecturing you. I, you you love him? Fine. That's great. If you were to ask me over Wine and Calzones, should I love him? I might say, well, he's largely a watered-down version of better Japanese authors. You could still love him. Of course you can, and I'd be happy to listen to it all. Maybe you'll change my mind on some books. But you could also read those other authors, and maybe you won't love him so much. Maybe you'll find better authors doing the same things, or similar things. That's fine. All of those conversations are fine. But if you love Haruki Murakami and you bat between him and Sally Rooney and you don't read anybody else, you shouldn't say either I love Japanese literature or I know Japanese literature. You shouldn't say either one of those. You don't love Japanese literature if you've never read anyone but Haruki Murakami. You like Haruki Murakami. And you certainly don't know it. That's all. All I'm saying is that you, that you not indulge in the 21st century fad of declaring your own reality and then deciding, making everyone else conform to it. That's all I'm saying. The earth is not flat. Trump did not win. Vaccines are not harmful. Indigenous science is not science. <laughs> That's all I'm saying here. But his list goes on. The Tales of Arabian Nights, uh, Joseph and His Brothers by Thomas Mann, The kind, the Kindly Ones by Jonathan Littell. That was a weird choice. Didn't see that one coming. The Novel by Michael Schmidt, which I reviewed. I think I reviewed The Kindly Ones as well. I've probably reviewed everything on this list in one, in one edition or another. Certainly, I've reviewed The Tale of Genji. I'm blurbed on the paperback for the Washburn translation. Uh, I might be blurbed on the paperback of Michael Schmidt's book, if it ever did have one. Michael Schmidt wrote a huge, big book about the novel in its progression through time. And it he is wonderful company. Any of you have ever read his book, The Lives of the Poets? He is wonderful company on the page. You look at the brick size of the book, and maybe a part of you quails, but the minute you start reading, you will, I know it's a cliche, but you will want it to be longer. You'll want him to just keep going. Uh, so I, I very much recommend the novel by Michael Schmidt. I recommend all these books, pretty much. I don't recommend Blood Meridian, but pretty much. Uh, I've never seen a copy of the, of the novel in the wild. I got rid of mine that I got from the publisher when I reviewed it. I've never seen it since. Uh, he goes on. Uh, that reading guy goes on. I should go on with him. Uh, the City of God by St. Augustine. Okay, another perfect example. You can read it or not. There are plenty of arguments for not. It's not, it's not an easy read at all. If you want to cover the great documents of Christian literature, fine. <laughs> but if all you've read of Christian literature are the little booklets that come out twice every year by Joyce Meyer, don't say you know Christian literature. That's all. That's all you have to do to please Steve. That's the only caveat here to my unless and you don't have to read hard books. You don't have to read hard books unless you want what they confer. You can't just 
say that you have what they confer. Is, is my point. Uh, but his list goes on. Uh, the Aeneids by Plotinus, uh, a little bit of a weird choice. Uh, the Gulag Archipelago by Solzhenitsyn. Uh, the House of Government by Yuri Sleskin, also blurbed on that paperback, along with a couple of other heavyweights that I doubt I'll ever share a cover with again. And A Secular Age by Charles Taylor. I believe that reading guy says in his video that you would have to be insane to have already read this book. <laughs> Uh, but, well, let's let's move on because all of these videos garnered another response video from a new booktuber. I strongly recommend his channel. I very much like it. I, he's a deliberate, deep thinker. I think you would like it. And the more subscribers he has, I think he and that reading guy are still disgracefully below even thirty subscribers. That's insane. They should have at least a couple of hundred. And you all know, you know how, especially those of you who make booktube videos, you know as ridiculous as it is. The only yardstick here should be the conversations in the comments field and the connections made offline. Nevertheless, as ridiculous as it is, it can motivate you if you suddenly have more subscribers than you have personal friends. That can motivate you. So by all means, go and subscribe to all these channels. Even subscribe to Grix, even though you know it's just going to encourage him. <laughs> the more subscribers he gets, the higher his hair gets. <laughs> but the, the, the next channel is to readers it may concern. He has a wonderful channel. And he responded with a list of his own that is pretty interesting. He starts, for instance, on What Matters by Derek Parfit, who just had a big fat biography that I waded my way through. Uh, it's it's moral philosophy. It's it's meta ethics. It's hogwash from beginning to end. A small child, a child who is ten, knows about ethics. Knows all there is to know about ethics. There's nothing complex about it. It is just meant for bearded chin stroking by dude bros like most of philosophy. And Parfit is also an awful pro stylist. Oh my God. <laughs> Not only are his ideas torturous, where he takes a self-evident precept, something that any child, that, that a bonobo chimpanzee would know, and just tortures it on the rack for 500 pages. Not only does he do that, but he does it in the most boring prose imaginable. But, again, if you want to read it, uh, first of all, I don't know why <laughs> you would want to read it when there are giant shark novels to read, but if you wanted to read it, Fine. If you don't want to read it, fine. But if you don't want to read it, you cannot claim that you have read moral philosophy, modern moral philosophy. You cannot do it. Parfit is too big a figure. So all I'm asking is that you either read it and, I don't know, enjoy it somehow. If you can figure out a way to enjoy it, feel free to tell me. Or don't say that. <laughs> don't make claims. Don't make your own iPhone reality. Just don't say it. That's all. Uh, but what, he goes on. His list of... Uh, He's a big Volman fan, which is awesome. I, I, I always bring a smile to my face when I see bookish Love Paradise by Toni Morrison, and I love it when anybody sticks up with an author they really like, even if they don't like them anymore. I love listening to, to Joe Spivey has, has said, is perfectly clear in saying that he was introduced to the literary world by Martin Amos, but has largely left him behind. Uh, but he's still a pretty trenchant commentator on Martin Amos. I think that there's something there. that Some part of that love still exists. And I love hearing about it. I love it when people bring in their authors. So it's Ollie at Criminali with Ed McBain. And here, uh, to readers that may concern, loves William Bolman. William, William Bolman, uh, he's a weird author. He's a problematic author in some ways. He's a daunting author. He writes bigger and bigger books. And the one that is specifically mentioned here is The Dying Grass which is a warm spot in my heart, because it was my very first review for the Christian Science Monitor. Uh, it's a big, ambitious book. I It made me pull my hair out at some points. It's maddening at some points. Uh, but at other times, brilliant. Uh, and I, not necessary. I hate to say it, but I don't think that literary history is going to remember Volman. He's just too weird. He's just too out of sync with all the currents that would be necessary to be remembered. So it may never actually be true that you have to read William Volman. That may never actually be true. And that's a little bit of a shame, I think. A little bit of a shame, because I think he's brilliant. Uh, but well, he, we move on. Main Currents in Marxism <laughs> by Kolakowski. Uh, that brought back memories. <laughs> uh, his list also includes the, the novel Ha, H-A exclamation point, by Gordon Shepard. Just, I, you've probably never heard of it. If Just... Go on Goodreads and read some descriptions of it. And then, if you're if you're a viewer of this channel, try and guess what I whether or not Steve likes it. <laughs> just, just try and guess whether or not Steve likes it. 
Uh, he mentions the structure of evolutionary theory by Stephen Jay Gould. Stephen Jay Gould wrote a giant magnum opus lifetime masterpiece thing. This giant, windy contemplation of evolution. The way that it's been growing. The way that thought and writing about it has been growing. A couple of his colleagues in the field, in the actual sciences, I mean, writing for peer-reviewed journals rather than for million-dollar sales in bookstores, uh, were pretty plain that he wasn't qualified to write such a book. It struck me as the type of thing that he'd been working on incrementally his whole life, and that it, you need this gigantic monument to your life. I think his collections of little ditty essays from natural history are a better monument than this thing. It is. It has his fluid readability. I just think it, it doesn't often, it's curiously circular. It doesn't often go anywhere. And it's certainly, there certainly is no you have to about it. If you like Stephen Jay Gould's prose style, uh, and I do, uh, then you'll definitely want to read this book. Let me know if you want an ebook so that I can spare you the cinder block of the hardcover. Uh, but no other reason. Uh, and that's true for a couple of things. There, there's also... Uh, uh, to readers it may concern, mentions the story of civilization by Will and Ariel Durant. Perfect example. This is exactly like the structure of evolutionary theory. It's beautifully, wonderfully, companionably written. They, it might look daunting. It, it, you've seen it in yard sales if you don't know it. It's a long collection of volumes where they, the authors go through the history of humankind. Starting with our oriental heritage, working their way through Caesar and Christ, uh, the, the age of faith, the Protestant Reformation, the Renaissance, the, all the eras of the modern time, all wonderfully done. The books have chapters, but the chapters have lots of subheadings and lots of uh, bracketed off sections. So it's actually not intimidating to read at all. The only intimid intimidating thing about it, I think two readers that may concern actually makes this point, the only intimidating thing about it is the sheer length of it on the shelf. Otherwise, no, it's a delight, an absolute delight to read. Uh, then the next one that, that he mentions is The Whispers by Orlando Fikes. I don't I'm quite know where this comes from. I don't recall it being a very long book. But then again, I guess we're not talking about length, because Paradise is one of the shortest things that Toni Morrison wrote. Uh, I also don't see its centrality, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. It struck me as a dashed off effort by an author who can do much better work. But uh, it's certainly hard to read in, in the, the emotional sense of the term. Maybe that's what Maybe that's what our, our YouTuber was going for. Then we have The Modern Mind by Peter Watson. Not sure what this is doing here. But if you want to read uh, The Modern Mind, I don't think it has any pretext of being a hard book. Uh, any more really than The Whispers or even Main Currents of Marxism. I, I don't know that, they, that some of these things have any pretext of being hard books. And they definitely don't have any prescription about them. Maybe Main Currents of Marxism. Maybe. But... Structure of Evolutionary Theory, uh, The Modern Mind, the, the Mind, The Whispers, these don't even have my little parenthetical unless. Uh, we move on to uh, The Matter of Things by Ian McIlchrist, uh, then Bottom's Dream by Arno Schmidt, and The Open Society and Its Enemies by Karl Popper. And I would argue that on this list, what have we got here? The Derek Parfit has my parenthetical unless. You don't have to read any of these things. Of course, you don't have to read any book unless you want to be able to say something about a collective heading of your reading. If you want to be able to say that something, you have to do the work of that something. You can't just stamp your foot and say indigenous science is science over and over and over until you get your way. This isn't, that isn't how it works. Reading is not done by mob rule the way social media is. I know that the, rule, the idea that it is was generated on social media, but it doesn't work backwards. Reading is not governed by that. If you want to know about moral, modern moral philosophy, you, you are not going to be able to say to someone, I'm very familiar with modern moral philosophy. I have them say, oh, so what do you think of Derek Parfit? And you say, I've never read him. You will be making a fool of yourself. I don't think there are many other books on two readers that may concerns list that actually fit that bill. But we have seen on all these lists that some of them do, whether I like them or not, whether I like the book. I don't like The Sound of the Fury at all. But you... If someone comes up to you, for instance, God forbid, I come up to you and say, you know, are you familiar with Southern American literature? And you say, yes, I'm very familiar with it. And I say to you, well, what do you make of The Sound and the Fury? And you say, I've never read it. I'm going to chuckle and stop the conversation because you're an idiot. 
<laughs> you can't, it doesn't work that way. That's my contribution to the bro discussion, is that it doesn't work that way. There is no prescription here at all. I think you should be reading only what you enjoy. It's true that your enjoyment might be long-term. It might be that you're putting yourself through some things. Volman wrote some clunkers. <laughs> it might be that you're putting yourself through some things in order to get the long-term joy of saying, I have read all of Hans, or, you know, Stefan Zweig, for instance, or Karl Abata. I've read all of him. I now have a sense of what his art does from its beginning to its end, and I wanted that. And that sense brings me a joy, even though some of the bricks in that wall were not enjoyable. Okay, fine. That's great. Or you could do the alternative. You could say, I just want to read for fun. I just want to enjoy what I'm reading. I don't want to do any of this long-term business. I just want to enjoy what I'm reading. I want the next book that I'm in, that I'm reading to be enjoyable. And if I get, if I give it a good faith effort, 30 pages, 40 pages, and I'm not enjoying it at all, I'm going to put it aside and find something else. Well, okay. That also is completely fine. That's completely fine. I want to point out, out of fairness, I should point out, that a good solid 90% of the books that I've mentioned in this video won't pass that test. A good solid 90% of the books on all of these, these lists are going to require more than that to get the joy that they can provide. Some of them not, but most of them yes. That doesn't matter. If you want that kind of joy instead of the other kind, they are equal. So it doesn't matter. It's still completely valid. All I'm asking, the unless in my, in my uh, formula here, is that some things have requirements. Colleges and universities, technical positions, qualifications in academia, outside of America. Again, outside of America. Outside of America, those things have qualifications. You need to do certain things in order to qualify. And literature is the same way. Reading is the same way. If you want to say, I know Southern, Southern fiction, you've got to read Eudora Welty, you've got to read Flannery O'Connor, you've got to read William Faulkner. If you want to say, you know Irish literature, You've got to read James Joyce, and it's got to be Ulysses, whether I like that or not. You can't simply avoid it because you don't feel like it, and your parents have a lawyer. <laughs> you can't do it. Nope. You Well, outside of America, you can't do it. Uh, and the same is also true in a broader, less focused sense of being, quote-unquote, well-read. You can think it all you want. Go right ahead and think it. I cannot. I'm not going to open windows into men's souls. But... You can't tell anybody that you're well-read and in the next sentence say you've never read any Shakespeare. All that's going to do is reveal you as being either naive or a moron. That's all. It's not going to change reality. <laughs> so that's my, that's my contribution here. You don't have to read hard books. Unless. <laughs> so I don't know if I've helped things or hurt them, but I will leave links to all these videos. You can go and listen to all of them. It's all wonderful. And, well... Since this is an arch, this is now this is now a game of keeping the beach ball up in the air. And since this is now an arch dude bro thing, I suspect I know, and I think you do too, who the rest of the participants should be. You other dude bro channels, time to put on your cow crap rings and make lists of your own. Weigh in on the subject. I can't wait to see it. So I'll, I'll wrap this up for now and I'll eagerly wait. <laughs> Thank you, BookTube.